you made it to church. Man, it's good to see you guys. And if we haven't met yet, I'm, I'm Pastor Peter. I just want to welcome everybody joining us online. We love you, and we love everybody at downtown and all joining us from all over the place. And, and we're going to have some fun today in church because I want to teach you how to survive a season of drought, okay, a season of drought. What is a season of drought? I've been talking about this a lot because I, I really believe that we're kind of going through a national season of drought. It's, what is a season of drought? It's a rough season. It's a season where some of us might lack joy. It's easy to, to, to catch outrage. It's easy to, you know, really just lack the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, those things. And so, you know, at some point in your life, you're gonna have one of those months, one of those years, years that you're going to want to forget, and maybe right now your life is just awesome, aren't you special? Okay, but take, take some notes anyway, because I really believe that seasons of drought are inevitable. It's not a question of, uh, of if, it's a question of when, but we don't have to fear them. We don't have to fear them when we understand how to gear ourselves up in those seasons. And keep in mind, I am preaching this as a guy who has a black belt in whining. Come on, somebody. Anybody else out there just really good? You got the gift of whining. You know what I'm saying? And, and you, you take it to a whole nother level. I got a PhD in cynicism. I'm not a naturally positive person. You know, like those people that are just like naturally positive. Don't you hate them? You know what I'm saying? It's like those people that it's like, no matter what's going on in their lives, I'm always like, how do you do it all the time? You're just like happy. And, and you know, they can have tragedy happening and, and God's probably sparing me of something worse, right? And then there's the rest of us, right? We pour the cereal and find out there's no milk and we're like, why is thou forsaken me? You know, like we want to post it on Facebook. I'm so angry, somebody has to pay. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just, you know, and some of you are like, I'm married to that person, okay? Don't look at the them right now. Don't look at them. Don't. Okay. So no, seriously, I, I just, I have to, I, I've had to apologize to my wife. The older I get, the more I'm like, I just can't believe anybody puts up with me, you know? And I, I just, uh, honestly, I, I, I even just, even just last week, you know, many of you guys know, I finally got rid of this neck brace from the spinal injury. And then, and the next thing that happens, I, I know, right? It's awesome. Right. But then I get an outer ear infection, right? And then I'm like, why do I? And it's like all week long, I'm like, what, what? And my wife is like, oh, shh. And I'm like, I can't hear. And then I'd whine about it. It's like, well, and then I'm just like, I, I finally had to apologize to my wife. I'm like, baby, I am so sorry that all I do is whine about my physical state. And I, I should just be grateful. I don't have a neck brace. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm just, I'm letting you know. Um, the reason why I'm sharing all this is because if God can use a person like me, you're good, okay? God can deal with you too. And I, I'm just, it's a testimony, right? And, and so to accomplish this, how in the world do I, do, I, do I allow God to work on my soul? Well, I'm gonna share some of these, these tips and tricks. And I wanna start with a quick passage out of Jeremiah chapter 17. And just to give you a little context, in the days of Jeremiah, there was huge political stability, instability, okay? Judah was God's people. Um, Israel had already been taken over by the Assyrians, and so Judah is like kind of the last little remnant of God uh, standing in the midst of all this political turmoil. The Assyrians were a big deal. The Egyptians were picking on everybody, and then the Babylonians are about to take everyone over, okay? So total political instability. So at this time, just to give you the context, everyone in Judah had political opinions about everything. Does that sound similar to any other time in history? Okay. So everyone in, in Judah had opinions, but they did not have peace. Opinions, but no peace. And so we read in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, this is what the Lord says. The prophecy came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. In other words, God's like, if you think a king or an alliance or a military person or a political solution or any human solution is going to solve this, then you have a curse on your life. 
The very fact that you think that way means you are cursed and it's not gonna go well for you. And then he goes on, the Lord goes on. Like people who trust in human solutions are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. And then I, in verse seven, I'm gonna switch to the, the NIV translation. And, and think about it, God's looking at this from a bigger picture, like, come on. The whole, as if, I, as if God hadn't seen a few political revolutions over the years, it just, it's like a big pendulum that just keeps swinging back and forth, back and forth. Nobody is ever satisfied, nobody is ever happy, but blessed, you wanna know who is happy? Verse seven, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. Let me say that again. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Okay, so now if you're sticking with this metaphor, if you want to know what kind of tree you are in a year of drought, if you want to know, it's actually quite simple. Are you worried in a year of drought? Yes or no? If you're worried, that means you're under a curse. That means you have something in your life that has become shaken, that is ill-placed. Are you fearing the heat? Because once again, it does not fear when the heat comes. It has no worries in a year of drought. Worry and fear are always the evidence of living under a curse. It is always the evidence of idolatry in our lives where we're fearing something greater than God. We're magnifying something greater than God. And so it begs the question, well, how do we avoid having this curse in our lives? Well, go back to verse five. God made it clear. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and who turn their hearts away from the Lord. Two things, two behaviors that result in a cursed life. Trusting in a human solution, something that you can bring about on your own nature or just voicing your opinions, right? Or turning your heart away from the Lord. In other words, t turning to uh, political solutions rather than spiritual solutions, right? That's why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's, it's not something that we physically do, it's spiritual. We're dealing with a spiritual battle that is influencing things, that is influencing humans. Now, uh, the reason why this is so profound, this contrast is really profound, is because I think a lot of us, we as Christians, we like to imagine we have a lot of faith, but, but until a test comes, right? Okay, there's a lot of Christians who imagine they're gonna live for Christ forever, and they're, they, they imagine they're fully devoted. I, I thought that I derived my joy from Christ, but actually, Actually, I realized, you know, I like shopping, you know what I'm saying? Even on my vacation, uh, just this last uh, couple of weeks, I happened to be in Florida, and of course, half of everything is shut down in Florida, and of course, I went to a mall, and it was the most depressing thing I've ever been to, you know, because like one out of like four stores was open, right? And of course, even the one, it was just, it was depressing, and I thought, oh, I hate this, like, and I was all crabby that day, you know what I'm saying? Like, I realized that I actually got more joy from shopping than I, than I previously thought, right? A lot of people, it, Really, it's no different than anybody else. A lot of you, you thought you derived your joy from the Lord, but actually it was sports. Actually, it was from being busy at work. Actually, it was from, you know, or, or I thought I derived my joy from, 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 from God, but actually it was all about my health, right? In the moment that my health, I have to wear a neck brace. God, where are you? You know what I'm saying? Like, it was a test for me. I had to actually decide, am I gonna choose joy or not? Or am I gonna believe in circumstantial joy? You know what I'm saying? I had to make a decision. Am I gonna choose joy or not? And, and, and in those moments when our agenda gets messed with, it, where life throws a, a curveball, a lot of us who thought we had faith in God, all of a sudden we get mad at God as if somehow God owes us, like we're entitled to all of this. And God's like, oh my gosh, you never believed in me. It just took a drought to, to reveal it. You know what I'm saying? We thought we believed in God, but actually we didn't. Or maybe it was like a percentage, right? You know, like we, 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 we get peace from God, but it's like 30%, and the other 70 comes from politics and us getting our political agenda working. You know what I'm saying? In other words, we're not actually trusting in Christ. Christ is just a tiny little add-on to this deeper idol that we have in our lives. Here's the truth. Christ does not wanna be an add-on in our lives. He wants to be the center of our lives, 
And why? Why? Because resurrection power, think about it, resurrection power only comes to things that are dead. Okay, God doesn't want to just have an add-on to your life. He actually wants you to put your agenda to death so that he can live through your life. You see, a season of drought for many of us is the only way for us to acknowledge Jesus is the way. And he'll allow a drought to, to cause our roots to wither a little bit until we figure this out. Amen? That's the whole reason why Christ came to the earth is that humans aren't good at figuring this out. God was like, oh my gosh, that's the best you can do. We better send the Savior down. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you the gospel here, okay? I'm telling you the gospel so that your faith is not misplaced in the wrong areas. God loves us so much that he's gonna test our character and our faith from time to time just to see if we actually do trust in him rather than earthly solutions, earthly circumstances. Many of you guys know that. Uh, as a church, we help plant a lot of churches. I help lead a, an organization that, that um, launches a church every couple days, actually, around the United States and around the world, and it's really weird coaching pastors on how to launch churches in the middle of this environment, right? And of course, uh, not surprisingly, uh, uh, we, uh, there's dozens of guys I mentor who have gotten really kicked out of their own facilities uh, under the pretense of COVID safety. And it's actually just uh, the amount of discrimination across the country uh, against Christianity has really been ridiculous. I mean, churches, mayors making it illegal for churches to use their own parking lots has nothing to do with science. Um, you know, mayors are actually trying to make it illegal in a lot of places for churches to record videos of their sermons is if somehow like, you know, video spreads COVID now. I mean, like, what the heck? It's ridiculous. Outlawing churches from videotaping worship. Uh, and then, of course, a couple of weeks ago, over 30 different counties in California made it illegal for Christians to do Bible studies in their homes now. And, and I'm getting off the phone with one of my pastor friends who's now stuck in this really weird legal predicament. And, and I, I was so disturbed. I, I was just, I went into full on fight mode. Have you ever been there where you're just like angry? I was like reading constitutional law. I was like, man, I'm gonna fly there and go to jail for Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like, have you ever been there? Come on, you know what I'm saying? You just got fired up. And of course, I, I, and I'm, I'm all for safety and science. I'm all for safety and science. But this is like 12 steps past ridiculous. And so my wife sees me, I'm like pacing like a lion. I am just wanting to devour people in the name of Jesus. And, and, and she goes, wow, somebody looks ready for a fight. And like when she said it, I just kind of like, it was almost like her comment just kind of snapped me out of my rage coma. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, like I, it was almost, you know what I mean? Like, like I was like the Incredible Hulk who just kind of woke up half naked as Bruce Banner. Like what just happened? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, and like, you know, all of a sudden I kind of laughed like, oh, you know, like, because I realized in that moment, I am not experiencing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is the sign that you are in sync with God. It doesn't even matter if you're technically right if you're out of sync with God. You can be right and still be dead right. Do you know what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says wisdom from heaven is pure, it's peace loving, it's considerate, it's submissive, all these things that seem to be missing in my own life at this moment. And out of nowhere, Jeremiah 17.6 just erupted into my heart. Cursed, Peter, are those who put their trust in mere humans. Don't be, it was like the Holy Spirit just impressed upon my heart. Peter, the answer to your problems is not political, it is spiritual. It is spiritual. And all of a sudden, the Old Testament story of Elisha and the chariots of fire just jumped into my mind. And I want to quickly read to you a portion of this famous story. You've, you've heard the expression chariots of fire, but it comes out of this Old Testament story in 2 Kings 6. And just to put it in context, okay, 2 Kings 6, at this time, there was this evil king, the king of Aram, who just kept attacking God's people, just kept attacking and attacking and attacking. And so what started happening was, is Elisha the prophet started saying, God, speak to me about the, what the, the king of Aram is doing next. And so God would literally just tell Elisha, this is exactly where the king of Aram is going gonna, is gonna to lie in wait to do his next attack. And so he would just go to the king of Israel and say, hey, the Lord prophetically told me this was going to happen. And of course, it was exactly what, what, what happened. And so God just kept speaking to Elisha about this. Well, it gets to the point where the king of Aram is so frustrated, like how in the world is Israel continuing to avoid me? 
how in the world, I, like I have to have a traitor in my ranks. There must be a spy, a double agent who is in my courts that is telling Israel about what we're doing. I mean, how else could they keep avoiding all of our traps? And so finally, an officer of this wicked king, he, he explains in 2 Kings 6.12, get this, I love this. So this officer in the court of the king of Aram said, it is not us, my lord, the king. We're not traitors, okay? We're not spies. We're not telling Israel anything. And he goes, Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Like, when, when non-believers are telling, you know, about, about how intimate you can be with God. I mean, think about that, okay? I, I wanted to stop here and say, if Elisha can have that kind of intimacy with God, guess who also can have that type of intimacy with God? We can. Did you know that you can actually hear the prophetic voice of God speaking and nudging you? And, and, and a lot of times it's not even a spooky thing. God just speaks to me through just Bible verses, just impressions. Peter, you know, just, just convicting me with the Bible. And, and, and I, I really believe that we can have that kind of relationship with God. And I believe he's still doing it. Jesus even said, those who come after me will do greater miracles than me. God actually has anointed us. He's given us access to his Holy Spirit to do even greater things than Christ, okay? So uh, we have no excuse in the New Testament to not have intimacy. We just have to choose it. So now, uh, so finally the king of Aram says, verse 13, well, okay, well, go and find out where this Elisha character is, the king commanded, so I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back, Elisha is at Dothan. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. So overwhelming force to Dothan, this little village in Israel. And of course, the goal was to capture and kill Elisha and then take over Israel. But check out what happens in verse 15. I love this. When the servant of the man of God, Elisha's servant, got up early the next morning and went outside. There were troops, there were horses, there were chariots everywhere. They're surrounding the city. And so he freaks out, he runs back in, wakes up Elisha, oh sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. And of course, you know, the servant had to have been like, okay, wait, wait, wait. I don't think you've been outside yet, Elisha. You gotta look and see. I mean, we're surrounded. And Elisha's like, there's, there's more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. It's like, come on, he clearly doesn't see what I see and what you're doing. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes, the Bible says, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. In other words, he sees this supernatural army that is defending the servant of God. In other words, he, he has spiritual eyes. He can suddenly see things in the spirit, what's actually happening. And as the Aramean army advanced towards him, Elisha prayed, oh Lord, please make them blind. I love that he, he, he asks his servant, the Lord, to, to open the eyes of his servant and to blind the eyes of the enemy. And of course, just to summarize the rest of the story, Elisha goes out to speak to the commander, which is pretty risky. I, I, I don't know, I mean, if an entire army was out to kill me, I don't know if I would just go right out there. But he walks right out to the commander of this army and he does kind of like a Jedi mind trick. These are not the droids you're looking for. You know, like something like that. Uh, uh, no, literally he says, this is not the city you're looking for and I am not the man. You know, like, but I know who the city is and I know where you can find him, right? I mean, he is Elisha. And yet he's like, I know the way to the city. And then, they're, and then, and then somehow they believed him. And why? Because God had blinded them. And so Elisha leads them straight into a location 
in Samaria where the king of Israel can capture all of them. And so, of course, the king of Israel gets word that Elisha is leading this Aramean army, delivering them into the hands of Israel. And, of course, the, the king of Israel is like, Elisha, how in the world are you doing this? Like, they're, they're after you to kill you, and yet somehow you're leading them into, you know, my hands. Like, how could you trick an entire army into believing that they went into the wrong location? And so, finally, you know, the king of Israel comes, surrounds this army, and, and captures them and finally asks Elisha, should I kill them all? Like, what do I do next, Elisha? And Elisha says, no, 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 no. You don't kill a prisoner of war like this. Do the exact opposite. Here's what I want you to do, king. I want you to throw them a banquet, and I want you to bless them. In other words, show them that you could have killed them but now instead you are showing them mercy. Let them know first off how, because they're gonna figure out really quick that our God is bigger than their God. You know what I'm saying? My dad's bigger than, my dad can beat up your dad, okay? And then, and then you can show them mercy and actually say, hey, I actually want the peace of the city. I want the peace of the region. And so in verse 23, that's exactly what the, the king of Israel did. So the king of Israel made a great feast for them and then sent them home to their master. And get this, here's the happy ending, the rainbow, right? After that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. They knew better, like, leave them alone. Come on, I, I love that. I love, that's, that should be the testimony of Christians in every city. I'm not saying things are always gonna go well for us, but at the end of the story, I do believe that, that at the very least, the devil's gonna leave, leave us alone when we actually stand in the authority that Christ has given us. God always wants to turn the tables on our enemies in a redemptive way. And, and the reason I'm sharing this is because I, I, church, I cannot help but to feel this. God is doing a similar thing during COVID. He's doing a similar thing through this season. And I know that it looks really bleak. I, I know there's hundreds of thousands of churches that still haven't even been able to open for, for, for weird legal reasons in various states. But I, I do believe that God is orchestrating a greater win for the body of Christ. But it, it, it's going to take you and I turning on our spiritual eyes in order to see it. You're not going to be able to see it. And, and hear me out. I'm not trying to downplay the pain of all the chaos that is happening around us, but I just really believe that, here, here's what I know about God, is that even if God answered every single one of my circumstantial prayers, you know what I would do? I would just go on worrying about something new. Why? Because that's my nature. It's my sin nature. It's the part of me that I need to crucify daily. You see, I believe that if God answered all of our circumstantial prayers, all we would do is just come up with new circumstantial prayers. God, I just pray now that, you know, not, once God blesses us, then we just go on whining about something else. That's because the problem is not circumstantial, it is a spiritual problem. We have to rectify that in our own souls. Your soul finds rest in God alone. And even more than that, um, listen, if we don't stop and acknowledge the spiritual issue here, uh, we're never going to be able to see God's plan of promotion. I think about how Elisha had the poise to go out and do this crazy plan and, you know, do the, the Jedi mind trick, so to speak, right? I, I believe that God is, we cannot operate in the creative spirit of God when we're obsessed with our problems. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, I'd like to put it this way. You cannot be a victim and a victor at the same time. You can't, you can't. In fact, I teach my kids this. They're, now, why do we play the victim ever? Well, we do it because we like sympathy, we like pity, and we do it because somehow we think by playing the victim that we're gonna win people over to our cause, but you know what? Uh, actually, you cannot experience the power of God and, and be a victim at the same time. It doesn't work, those two are incompatible, right? We either, I can do th all things through Christ who gives me strength or nothing. You see, God made it very clear. You cannot play the victim and be a victor at the same time. At some point or another, you and I have to choose, do we trust the God of the Bible or do we not? And the good news is this, God always has chariots of fire, always. It's, it's, just, it's just a matter of, hey, are we gonna open up to God's plan and watch him do his redemptive plan? Or are we gonna take matters into our own hands and just bring about another bloody revolution that just, the pendulum just keeps swinging and swinging and swinging? Unfortunately, history is rife with carnal solutions that are only temporary. If we don't deal with our hearts, we're not dealing with anything. As one last example, I, I just, 
Many of you guys know that all throughout the Bible, there's all sorts of really practical miracles. God just keeps showing up in practical ways. It's kind of like, you know, Peter had a financial problem and God tells him, hey, I want you to go fishing and you're gonna find a coin that will pay for your taxes, right? And so of course, Peter's like, okay, I'm gonna, what? And he goes fishing and sure enough, opens up the, the belly of a fish and finds the exact amount of this coin to pay his temple tax. You see, the, the Bible is replete with stories of practical provisions. God wants us to live with supernatural advantages. Do you know that? God wants you to live with supernatural advantages in your life. And it doesn't mean you're not gonna go through hardship. It just means that at the end, you're gonna look back and all you're gonna have is great stories. Right? You gotta have a test to have a testimony, right? And God wants you to have great testimonies. And so uh, a while back, I, I heard the story through the Billy Graham Association of, a, an, of an Egyptian woman who she kept hearing these stories from the gospel and she finally made this decision like, hey, if the God of Christianity is truly that generous and that practical, then you know what, I would rather be a Christian. And so she converted to Christianity from, from Islam. And you have to understand in Egypt, it's very much illegal to do that. Um, you can convert to Islam legally, but you cannot convert vice versa. And, and, and so, uh, in fact, actually in countries like that, it's, it's very, very common for mercy killings. People that convert to Christianity will just disappear. And, uh, and, and I've, I've even known, I've even had friends in Egypt that have um, ha experienced this of relatives where they just, they converted to Christianity. And so they have to have like these covert churches that are particularly for Islamic converts because being in public is, is, is very dangerous in the first couple of years. And sure enough, this woman can converts to Christianity and her husband was horrified. Like, how could you do this to our family? You are wrecking, you realize now my job is at risk because you're a Christian. And he was so angry at his wife that he just, he just lashed out and, and went super abusive on her to a degree that she began to wonder if she's even safe. Like, is my, could my husband and my relatives actually plot to kill me now that I have converted to Christianity? And she actually had good reason to be afraid because that's exactly what her husband was, in fact, doing. He became so mentally ill and bent out of shape about her conversion that he felt like his only solution was not only to kill his wife, but to kill his wife, his kids, and himself. And yet he wanted to control the narrative and so he made this decision that the way he's gonna do this is he's gonna frame his wife for a crime that she didn't commit at the time, he was working at a bank, and he decided he's going to falsely accuse her of stealing the keys to the bank from his job to do something nefarious, maybe, uh, you know, rip off money from the bank, and he was going to uh, just explain this to his coworkers that he caught his wife. And, and he, but of course, you know, in his conscience, he was feeling extremely guilty about this. And so he thought, you know what? I need to get good and drunk first before I do this. And so on his way to the tavern, he, uh, he was crossing over the Nile River, which is a pretty wide river. If you've ever been to Egypt, it's, you know, like in, in Cairo where he would cross, it's, it's, you know, like the Mississippi, it's pretty large. And so he's crossing over this giant bridge and he takes his keys and he whips them into the river. And then he's gonna accuse his wife later that day. Well. In the meantime, his wife was going to the market to buy the evening meal and she's getting all the food and she decided at the market, you know what, I'm gonna cook up a big Nile perch. And so she purchases this, this giant Nile perch and she's gutting the fish back at home and to her astonishment as she opens up this fish, there were the keys of her husband inside of this fish and she's looking at this like, how in the world could these keys have gotten inside of this? These are my, this is clearly my husband's keychain. And she thought, oh my gosh, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Like, okay. And, and so she, she cleaned them off and she put them on the hook. And, 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 and now later that day, you know, she's just waiting for her husband to come home to say the weirdest thing happened. Well, now her husband comes home sufficiently junk, drunk at this point, and And he was about to, you know, uh, execute his terrible plan, his gruesome plan. And, and so he, he slams open the door and he goes, woman, where are my keys? And, and, and of course, she immediately gets up and she's like, oh my gosh, your keys, you'll never believe it. I found them in a Nile perch today that I opened up. And she handed it to her husband, like here they are. And of course the husband was just like shell-shocked at this point, like, like, this is not what I planned. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like what, do you, what do you mean? And, and, and he, was, he was so scared. All of a sudden, he had this fear of the Holy Spirit come upon him. He was so disturbed that he literally fell on his knees and, and, 
And, and he's like, I need the God that you serve to come into my life. And he confessed everything. He confessed everything. And then he, he obviously made the decision to go get help and, and psychological help. And, and, and he converted to Christianity right there on the spot. And um, even more miraculous, years later, that couple ended up getting back together and they're now happily married, going to an amazing church there. And I, I, I heard that story and I thought, you know, that's exactly what, what the type of God we serve. We, have, we serve a God who always has a redemptive plan that he works out for those that love him, Romans 8, 28. The only way that you and I can miss out on that plan is by failing to see what God sees. God doesn't promise that we'll always be treated right. God doesn't promise that life will always be quote unquote fair, but he does promise to work all things together for the good of those that love him. And the only way that we can miss that plan is by failing to see what God sees and getting in sync with that new plan that he's orchestrating. And I'm saying this because church, right now the world is filled with more anger than ever before, but man's anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires. It's filled with politics, it's filled with opinions, it's filled with, with carnal, trust in human type of strategy, strat, strategies. And I really believe it's easy to catch that spirit instead of the spirit who is from Christ. God says, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from Christ, that you may understand what God has freely given us. And church, listen, I believe that just like God spoke to Elisha about the enemy's plans, what if God had a prophetic word for you today about your parenting, about your finances, about your health, about your marriage that would take it to a whole new level? Listen, the question is, does, is not, does God have wisdom for you? The question is, are we listening? Are we seeing? Do we have the spiritual eyes to see the great and glorious plan that God has for each one of us? And so today what I want to do is I just want to end by praying a simple prayer, similar to the one that Elisha prayed over his servant, and it's this. Oh, Lord, open, open our eyes. Oh, Lord, open our eyes to see what you're doing in such a time as this. And maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe you've never prayed that prayer, open my eyes. Listen, right here, I'm going to end with a simple little repeat after me prayer where you can do that. Or maybe you've prayed that prayer before, but you know that if you were truly honest, your heart has not been trusting in the Lord and your current circumstances would actually reveal that you've been living the cursed life and God wants you to switch over to the blessed life. Hey, if that's you, I'm just gonna end with a, a short and simple prayer. And if you're watching at substancechurch.com, as I pray this prayer, just press that little raise hand button as just an act of faith. And I believe God is gonna respond to that simple act. And maybe you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or somewhere else. And hey, listen, this is what I want you to do is the moment I start praying, if you wanna just get serious with God, text the word substance to 31996. Just put substance to 31996 as an act of faith. And I just believe that God is gonna show up in an area of your life where you need it most. Would you do that with me? Just everybody, would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's just take the thing that we're worrying about and lay it down before him right now. And just ask him for his grace right now. God, open our eyes. Open our eyes. Lord, that we would see just the, the, the incomparable power for us who believe, the hope, Lord, the chariots of fire. The, you just wanted to give a huge demonstration to Elisha's servant, just how much you love us and how much you, you favor us. And so God, I just pray for everyone that we would wake up to the new reality that there is no greater position than to be on our knees surrendering to you. And church, if, if what I'm praying is a prayer that you can agree with, then just say this after me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me, renew me, and lead me starting today and for the rest of our lives. And if you agree with that prayer, just say amen. 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 With all that said, we're going to have our campus pastors come on up and tell us where we're going to go next. But I love you guys. We'll see you next week. Come on, give it up for Pastor Peter. What a great message. What a powerful word. Could you go ahead and stand with me? Man, what a word in season. Thank you, Pastor Peter, for that word. And, and listen, I, we truly believe in substance that God has freedom for your life. He has a plan and purpose for your life that is far beyond what you could ever ask for or imagine. We believe that. We believe that God is releasing purpose and destiny through this word as we surrender to him and we get an idea 
for his plan for our life. We say this all the time. We truly believe that, and that this may be hard to understand, but we truly believe that this can be your best year if it's your best year spiritually in Christ, if you live surrendered to him. Not many people are saying that about 2020, but we truly believe that. We're seeing miracles take place every single weekend at Substance right now as we have been on mission to love this city, to serve. Who's been a part of Love This City so far? Who's done a serve day? Who's gone out to Manor Market? I, listen, it's amazing. Every Sunday night at about 8 p.m., I get text messages of miracles that are taking place in people's lives when the church meets their tangible needs. When the church shows up and said, hey, here's food, here's resources. We want to just, we just want to pray for you. We want to connect with you. And I, I don't want to miss what God is doing in the midst of what may seem uncertain. God is moving. God is at work. And it's because of your generosity. It's because of your faithfulness to faithfulness with the tithe, faithfulness to give, to live generously, that God is using the work of Substance Church to feed as many people as we can. And, and listen to this. Since COVID-19 started, we have given away over 1.7 million pounds of food to serve people, which feeds thousands of people which meets needs and, and, and we have a mission not to stop we, we don't want to just do an event we want a lifestyle of loving this city and these cities that we're in amen and so as, as you participate in giving here you're just feeding that you're fueling that and uh you can give online there's uh if you're with us check out the giving link in the chat below uh check out the screen behind me if you're physically here today or if you're here physically you can give in the buckets in the back of the room many different ways you can participate in giving but we believe that we can live a generous life and then we receive a blessing back into our life and who could use more joy who could use more peace who could use freedom in their circumstances man God's going to show up and meet you as we live out the mission of being the church once again church doesn't start until the service is over God's got a plan for you amen amen let's go ahead and pray Lord I just thank you that you're alive and at work in our lives that you're not a far off philosophy you're an ever-present savior that wants to meet us where we're at and you you just don't want to leave us there, God. You want us to take us on this beautiful journey of finding freedom, of discovering our purpose, of being on mission to be your church. And I thank you, God, for what you're doing in the Twin Cities. I thank you, Lord, that you've birthed in people's heart the, the passion and the desire to love this city and, and to share Jesus with them, that this will be a Jesus city. And we thank you, God, as we worship you in our giving, as we worship you in song, we say you alone are worthy to be praised and honored. So God, make us new today. Renew us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. <laughs> 